Terrific, thank you. Um, so my name is Shlomi Raz, I'm the founder of Elucid. So uh, clinical trials have revealed that psychedelics are uh, antidepressants, and Johns Hopkins has recently initiated a trial into the, into the use of psilocybin for the treatment of depression, specifically associated with Alzheimer's disease. I mention that because the therapeutic potential of psychedelics extends far beyond psychiatry. And so for 6,000 years, uh, peyote was used as a traditional medicine. Its primary use was to relieve pain and to treat inflammation. Uh, the medicine man, when asked by Richard Evans Schulte, the father of uh, ethnobotany, said that we use peyote the way the white man uses aspirin. Uh, in, 2000 and, in 2008, our scientific founder, Charles Nichols at LSU, discovered that some psychedelics are potently anti-inflammatory at dose concentrations that are unlikely to be perceptible. Uh, in 2013, uh, a few blocks away from here, I founded Eleusis to pursue this particular opportunity. Uh, I, was, uh, I was at the time at NYU um, studying to be a psychotherapist. And uh, that's when my training from my days at Goldman Sachs kicked in, and I realized that this was going to be a huge opportunity. So um, I'd like to say we were the first psychedelic company, and, and quite ironically, uh, our first objective was to develop these drugs for sub-perceptual use. Um, and so we have uh, conducted clinical trials with LSD at sub-perceptual dose levels. Uh, we have also developed an entire pipeline of new chemical entities that appear to be uh, potently anti-inflammatory at sub-perceptual dose levels. And we are going to be treating chronic uh, inflammation associated with aging. Uh, aging both drives inflammation and is driven by inflammation in a process called inflammaging. And the compounds that we are developing uh, have efficacy in multiple translational models. Uh, so whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, whether it's respiratory, asthma, whether it is cardiovascular disease. And uh, strangely enough, uh, if, we can, if we can move quickly, the first psychedelic drug uh, may be uh, approved for ophthalmology. And that's where we're, we're, we're focusing our initial efforts. And so ultimately, we were inspired by the uh, example of GW Pharma. And so from a cannabis perspective, that's where we're coming from, which is to take a stigmatized drug and make it a valuable medicine develop it just like any other life science company. And that's what we're doing. We are dedicated to the transformation of psychedelics as medicines. And we think that given the preclinical evidence, the opportunity dwarfs that uh, of anything that we've seen, certainly in the cannabis space. And it's very exciting to be involved in that effort. Let's start on the line here. Laurie. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Um, Laurie, I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Time Life Sciences. We are a mental health care company um, that is also looking at psychedelics, but more broadly at the relation of the psychedelic states of mental health. Um, and our core, for, core focus is basically three indications, it's addiction, depression, and anxiety. And we started at Time Life basically out of very personal motives. So the founder and more broadly every team member had a very personal exposure to mental health illnesses or disorders. Um, I myself suffered from anxiety disorder in my teens, 42 years old. So for me, therapy worked quite well. And then there was another life event two years ago when uh, we lost, lost the mother of my wife to cancer that um, deeply traumatized my wife. Um, and for her, the, kind of the usual treatment patterns that are available or standard of care uh, didn't really do anything, it didn't really work. So um, a friend of mine and co-founder at the time actually pointed us to the therapeutic potential of psilocybin and to the study that was going on at here at Hopkins in 2016 done by Owen Griffith. Um, and that was basically the starting point where we realized, as it was such a healing experience for my wife, um, when she had a high dose of psilocybin in Amsterdam, where it's sort of legal. And um, yeah, that was kind of the main, main driver. And we started one and a half years ago. Uh, had Compass Pathways as one of the first portfolio companies, or platform companies, and then um, moved on to, to onboard now uh, over the last one and a half years, seven more companies that are yeah, dedicated to really make a leap forward in this space in terms of uh, bridging the gap of what's available right now and what's desperately needed for the millions of people that suffer from these three indications. 
trauma or lack of meaning that is often the underlying cause of addiction and depression, and then more kind of as maintenance or you know, kind of bridging uh, therapy with, with the other compounds that we have in development, and what's a kind of a common or, or yeah, kind of a com common approach that we have is that all those compounds are inherently healers as they have in one, one way or the other proven to be safe um, or efficacious in humans, uh, either anecdotally or based on the data that we have, for instance, on psilocybin from the 50s and 60s. So psilocybin has been approved or has been sold by Sanders back in the days. So basically looking at compounds where we fairly fairly certain that um, there are no big surprises on the safety side, and we at least have any total evidence that they're efficacious, such in the case of psilocybin, ibogaine, um, and so forth. So maybe that's to yeah. add to your point. Yeah, and I think to echo Florian's point, which is a very good one, I'll try to just quickly. Um, using anecdotes and historical data, I think is, is really within this area a, a very attractive uh, profile from an investor perspective, right? The fact that uh, these compounds were in use for 6,000 years. It's a pretty long phase one study. And, um, and I think, you know, to also echo the point regarding the uh, safety profile, um, you know, being able to use compounds that have, you know, extensive uh, testing in preclinical studies gives this area a huge degree of uh, attractiveness from an investment perspective. Um, you know, there's, I think, 40 or 50 percent of all drugs fail at phase one. And the fact that we know that these drugs will not fail at phase one, uh, from an investor perspective, we think is a very attractive profile. I, I would have a few comments to this, because I, I agree with both of you. I, I think, and, and maybe this is biased from 20 years in pharma, but I think you really want to start with the end in mind in any investment. How are you going to get out of it at the end of the day? Are you going to sell it to somebody? Are you going to market it yourself? Um, and if so, how are you going to do that? And do you have the resources? So I think with any investment, and especially in the life sciences, you really just have to look at three things. You know, is there a personal connection? Are you excited about the story? And the, and the story can be personal. The story can be, I just love this science and I want to see if it works. The story can be the patient, which I, I hope is always in our minds and our hearts somewhere. And then you have to start thinking about other things. Is, is the team in place? that the regulatory agencies in particular the FDA is very open to 
new ways for new innovation in this space, especially also psychedelics. So, and that's received psychotherapy designation for their MDMA um, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD 2017, followed by Compass Pathways for solid problems for treatment of resistant depression, and also Utona received it for a new uh, major depressive disorder. Um, so we see a great openness in, in the space from regulatory from the re regulatory agencies as well as also from the science community. So this year at the ACMP in, in um, Florida, there were, there were different, different panels that were actually putting this on the agenda and, and, and talking about psychedelics as, as a potential uh, medicine. So that's very encouraging um, from my perspective. Um, and in terms of funding, I think, and it was mentioned, I think, in the previous talk, so um, in the last two, three years, I'd say traditional investors were reluctant and, and skeptical, um, but this year at JPM, we, we saw that this is really changing and that there's a real interest now picking up from a farmer, but also from the more tra traditional crossover funds, biotech funds, so that's very encouraging to see. Yeah, I would say, um, so I was a naive amateur walking into all of this. Uh, I came from a background on the trading floor, and so I had to learn how to conduct a clinical trial and do all of this. And so it was quite strange. My last day at Goldman, if you would have asked me, uh, what's more likely, you're abducted by aliens or you're uh, sponsoring a clinical trial giving LSD to the elderly in London, right? Well, I've heard of alien abduction. And, uh, but there we were. And so what were the hurdles of doing that? Well, the good thing about LSD is that it has a remarkable safety profile, right? It has extensive preclinical literature. So when we approached the MHRA, which is the UK regulatory authority, and we came in with the thought leaders in the Alzheimer's space saying, hey, this is worth a try, they, they were uh, not only supportive of it, but very encouraging. And I would just echo the point that, that Florian made here is that the regulators are clearly not a barrier. They're, in fact, waving the green flag. They are very encouraging. They, are, uh, they know more about this space than many of the scientists in this space, right, in terms of its history. I mean, I, I'm quite impressed with their knowledge, uh, both the FDA and the MHRA. I would say that the other challenges, uh, patients, you know, certainly recruitment rate, as any good clinical trial uh, expert will tell you, you know, it's just about how many patients you can get in and how fast you can get them in. Uh, we were advertising for our studies on the back of double-decker buses, which kind of blew my mind, you know, would you like to participate in a study? Didn't mention LSD, um, but the, getting a recruitment rate high enough to get your trial done quickly is really crucial because every moment in the clinic is costing you a lot of money. And then lastly, in terms of the capital, I think that's really the, the big question. Uh, and again, I point to GW Pharma, right? They're, they're a $4 billion market cap company, but back in 1998, no one wanted to touch them. And the way they got their first clinical trials funded were from individual investors and family offices before they were able to attract institutional capital. I was also at JP Morgan, and I had a lot of great meetings with very large, very well-known VCs, and they say, oh, this is very exciting, we wanna back you, but get the asset to phase 1B first. And so there's an opportunity for investors that are not traditional life science investors to play a, a crucial role with a lot of the companies that may not be kind of venture backed. And so I think there's a unique opportunity, but that window is gonna be closing very quickly. So I wanna drill into that a little bit. Can you uh, maybe paint a picture of what, uh, of who is funding this right now proportionally? Um, obviously retail investors, family offices, but you know, when will we see the first, uh, first pension back VC budget, let's say? I think that's probably a better question for Florian because they, Atai has raised a significantly, uh, you know, significant amount of money, more than any other um, for-profit venture in the space by far. I would say that uh, tell you, if you look at our cap table and kind of who's funded Elucis so far, uh, you know, my wife's kids that I used to have money and now I don't, right? So uh, certainly I put in all my money into this because I, I'm never gonna see anything like this again, I'm all in. Um, and the people that came in either were convinced that I knew how to make money, they knew nothing about psychedelics, or they had some sort of life-changing experience and that they were committed to the mission. And so what's interesting is that oftentimes people think that investing is kind of a neocortex type of thing, like you evaluate this, you evaluate that. I found that to be not the case after 15, 20 years of trading floor experience. It's just emotional. And to the extent that people feel like it's a good investment, then they tend to be involved in, in this space. 
Uh, asset managers, they act more like herd animals, and so once like a, a, the lead steer starts moving in this space, you'll see the whole herd move into the space. Corian, same, same question. Um, obviously, like Shelly said, you guys have raised a lot of money um, discussing what you'd like to discuss. Can you, can you talk about uh, what, what your investor base looks like? Um, yeah, sure. I think we can basically identify three groups in general that we're in talks with or that we raised uh, money from in the, in the past. There are certainly the visionaries like Peter Thiel and Keith Robertson who are kind of involved in or where they work for Facebook, Tesla and SpaceX that really believe there's um, there, there is something big there and that deserves um, the, to be backed. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of the impact investors and mostly family offices, um, billionaires that believe in the, in the cause that we're doing. And the second group is, is more of the momentum investors, kind of as I would maybe call them. So looking for the next trend after cannabis, after crypto, and seeking a good, good kind of return of investment. Um, and then the third bucket, and that's something that is picking up now, only yeah, over the last month, I would say it's super, um, serious interest from pharma and more traditional biotech investors that um, were so far staying away from from the field. Uh, Terry, similar question. I mean, obviously you you've been in, in the field for a long time. Um, how uh, how is working with uh, ketamine, I guess, different than any other drug that you've developed in your career? Um, so I actually come from the research side. Research side. So, but but it's an important differentiation because for that question, I, I'm used to being the first person who ever made a molecule. Um, ketamine's been on the market for 50 years. <laughs> so it was made in the 60s or the 70s. So um, for me, it's really a development question um, to really sort of skip the whole classic R&D um, phase and, and to move right into development. But it's actually an interesting molecule because it's been our ketamine, not, not ketamine, that's very, very important that we talk about the single isomer here. Our ketamine has been half of every dose of ketamine that's been dosed for the last 60 years. Um, you talk about uh, you know, 6,000 years of phase one. This has been phase two, three, on the market for generations um, at extremely high doses compared to what we're going to be looking for. So there's this tremendous um, database that teaches us you know, the two things you, you need in a molecule, you need to show that it's safe and you need to show that it works. Well, we know it's going to be safe. I, I don't think there's any doubt about this. Even our, our you know, informal discussion with regulatory agencies, they accept this. They, they certainly want us to go back and dot some I's and cross some T's, but they accept the fact that this is going to be safe at the doses we're going into. Um, and now the question is, is it going to work? And, and what is that window and what does safe mean? So, we're pretty sure from the animal work and from some anecdotal studies that our ketamine is going to be a very effective and rapidly acting antidepressant. Um, our challenges are to figure out how to dose it, and there are various um, ideas there. And our real challenge is to show that this compound has a therapeutic window between, um, between activity and, and, and sedation or disassociation, disassociation that makes it suitable for home use so that it doesn't have to be given in a clinic for a psychiatrist's office. And if we can hit those marks, this is going to be a tremendously powerful tool for patients and for, for psychiatrists, um, and, and that's our goal. So I, I want to take a, a forward look now um, at, at the policy side of things. Um, what, I mean, in, in very broad strokes, like where are we going to see some of these compounds uh, maybe a decade down the road? Like, are they going to be descheduled, moved to a different schedule? Um, I, I'm kind of curious about what uh, what your perspectives are on that. And um, for maybe we'll start with you. Um, sure. So, um, hopefully, in patients. <laughs> so that's that's our our focus. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm. I'm generally skeptic about kind of the legalization endeavors in this field because it's such a powerful compound that should be uh, given in a safe and therapeutic and clinical setting. In, 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 so that's the price conviction. So um, it, it looks like should be reluctant to be kind of a proponent for, for recreational uh, use here. Um, so 
I guess it will take uh, another three to five years to really roll out the psilocybin therapy, so that's basically the most advanced um, compound that we have in development uh, on, 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 on the entire platform. So uh, basically demonstrating that it's scalable, that it actually can reach, uh, reach the patients in, in a scalable manner. And then also with the other compounds, I think scalability is one of the key, key, key challenges I think it was also raised in the, in the last, last uh, um, talk. So that's what we're dedicated to, to kind of, yeah, put money behind to then also see how you can treat those molecules to make the duration shorter and then to kind of, uh, well, while maintaining the efficacy to kind of dem demonstrate that it's scalable. But for us, it's really about getting better treatments for patients, not so much um, think about what could be uh, could be happening from a policy perspective in 12 years. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, you know, we're, we're focused on like a different space. So psychiatry has its own challenges in terms of, you know, having to do this inpatient or not inpatient. Uh, the drugs that we're developing, by definition, have to be outpatient. And so the good thing is that there's very well established precedent for this. Uh, many people don't know there's actually an FDA approved uh, psychedelic on the market. It's not a great trip, but it's called Lorcaserin, Belvic. And so Belvic, uh, when you take four times the recommended dose, you're gonna have a bad trip. And therefore, when Arena Pharma got FDA approval for the drug, it immediately went to the DEA, and the DEA scheduled it, Schedule 3, right? Um, there's another great example, Jazz, Pharma, and Xyrim, right? Xyrim is also GHB. GHB is Schedule 1, but Xyrim is Schedule 3. And the reason why it's Schedule 3 is that Jazz Pharma created a risk mitigation system to prevent the kind of misuse or diversion of that drug to people that were abusing it. So I think that the answer for, like, for example, LSD, if we demonstrate that LSD is efficacious in preventing Alzheimer's disease, there will be a way to get it to patients. And, and I think that the answer there is, frankly, you look at the safety margin. The safety margin for LSD is not gonna be great, right? If you take twice the recommended dose, you're gonna have some psychoactivity, and therefore, there will have to be a robust risk mitigation system in place, which is something we're developing and we think is a core part of the intellectual property. But when it comes to ophthalmology, when our safety margin is better than lorcaserin, then we would expect to be scheduled for or even unscheduled depending on the safety margin that we demonstrate. And the FDA and the DEA have been incredibly clear on this point, and so I don't think there's any ambiguity in terms of how these drugs are gonna be classified or, or regulated. Okay, and I think in general, once you have actually proven medical use, then it has to be rescheduled in a certain time period, so. Um, and, and we've discussed this a little bit that, that the regulators are, are forward thinking on this, but how much of your role is, is educating regulators? Um, Sean, we can start with you again. Yeah, yeah zero. Uh, the, uh, the education maybe is more about how the drug actually has effect in the disease, but as it relates to policy implications or educating them about like psychedelics in general, uh, I can tell you that you know the representatives at the FDA, the DEA, the MHRA, They've had a tie and compass roll through town. They've had Rick Goblin talking to them for like a, at least a decade. Uh, they've had Sona and Hefter talking to them for at least a decade. And so they, just by process of osmosis, like if nothing else, they know more about psychedelics than I think, again, a lot of researchers do. And so I give a lot of credit to the regulators. There's absolutely no amount of time that we have to spend to educate them about this class. No, I would just say that, you know, we're not in those discussions yet. Um, I, I think that, I completely lost my thought here. So, um, but I think in, in general, um, there is a knowledge base there. Um, and we just have to make sure that any, any acceleration of a pathway, the, re the regulators will always want things done completely and thoroughly. And we just have to make sure that any um, diversion from that, because in our case, ketamine's been around for a long time, it's completely justified, it's completely discussed, it's discussed in the open, and we don't go in with the assumption that, of course, they're gonna let us get by with this study instead of that study because it's been around for so long. So I, I think that um, discussions with regulators should always be an open discussion. It should be a clear discussion, and you should understand 
what, what their job is, um, except for I say understand that your job is to bring it straight. So we're uh, coming up on the end of our time here. Should we take it over to Q and A? Is that sure? Um, questions? How should we do this? Let's start. Let's go right to left. So I have two quick questions. The first is, Harry, how do you think about ketamine to, uh, to uh, addressing depression as opposed to LSD or other psychedelic compounds? Because I'm seeing that both potentially are a cure. So how do you think of when, does, when is ketamine the right solution versus uh, psilocybin? Um, that's my first question. I'll let you answer, and then I'll ask the second. So, so I'm not sure I, I'm qualified to, to do this. I, I, I'm a PhD chemist, not an MD psychiatrist. So, um, but I would just say that right now, at least, that um, there's a lot of clinical use of ketamine off-label in depression clinics, and I think that there's 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 a growing understanding of how to use at least ketamine in clinical use, um, and I really don't know uh, how that compares to, for example, the use of LSD in clinical use, which is probably a 